to this. It's like different grades of coal. Uh, anthracite is the most uh, compressed. Yeah, go ahead. Let me interrupt you right there because it turns out I messed up and uh, did not press the go live button. So I should, <laughs> should have done that. So now is the start of the live stream. Um, so actually, let's go back um, and, and maybe we can make that a little smoother on the second try here um, for the, uh, the clip. So uh, we're not going to be able to have audio for the clip, but, um, but we'll show some video. So uh, this is from the film Hard Coal, uh, which was directed by Mark Brodzik, um, came out in 2009. And, uh, and this is a section from a uh, found footage uh, educational film about um, coal. So coal comes from, it's a fossil fuel. So dinosaurs and plants, you know, uh, millions of years ago uh died are that organic matter is underneath the ground and so th through the pressure pushing that organic matter together um that formed coal um so i apologize so the first question that i uh that i asked you um was where are you from what's your background um and uh and how did that get you interested in in this subject and i also wanted to ask um you know, what's the difference between bituminous and anthracite coal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm from uh, central Pennsylvania. Uh, some of these pictures here, there's one of a downtown down the main street, and you can see a giant pile of coal at the end. Uh, that was my view from my house for a little while. I'm from Northumberland County. Um, and I grew up around it. You know, there's lots of uh, piles of waste coal everywhere. That one in the video is called Coal Hill. Lots of people like to ride dirt bikes on it, you know. Uh, and there's just not a whole lot of mining going on still. But, uh, but out there, a lot of people do a lot of things out in the abandoned coal lands or semi-abandoned coal lands. You know, there's a lot of partying. There's a lot of, like I said, off-roading picnics, whatever, you know. And... Uh, I was, you know, I was just like wondering where did, where did this start? Why did we treat it like we own it when we all know that Reading Anthracite owns it? Um, and uh, yeah, digging deeper and deeper, I've got into the history of bootleg coal mining. And uh, while it's a thing that everybody out there knows about, there's some people who still call themselves bootleggers, though they're independent miners, like more officially because they have leases. Um we know it's like a lineage. We know it's a thing. More people used to do it. But the history I found is just, it's way bigger than I knew about. There was way more going on. There's a lot of confrontation. Um, and I don't know. I It was kind of a fun, it was fun to do the project because I was just continually fascinated. Even now, like I pull up a news article or something about it. I'm like, oh, that, somebody said that too, you know? Um, but so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Important background, even if it seems a little nerdy, is the difference between the types of coal. Um, bituminous coal is what most people think of. It's the stuff that's in West Virginia, Western PA, all the way from Illinois down to Alabama. Um, lignite is the stuff they got out in Wyoming, uh, which is very uh, low carbon content. That's like the difference between the coals. So um, lignite is like the least efficient, but it's what they're easy to, able to get the easiest with some of the biggest machines on Earth. Anthracite is uh, the highest grade, right? Most carbon, least other things like sulfur in it. Um, but it's really hard to get to, right? So um, bituminous mines, you know, they are, they're like horizontal, if you think of it that way, whereas anthracite is compressed like that. And so the coal runs in veins. Um, and a lot of the places that can still be found where it hasn't been mined out already is almost vertical, like 15 degree slopes and things like that. And so either needs to be strip mined with small machines um, or deep mined. And there's still a few people who do it. But because the slope is like that uh, and because the seams can be small and crop out in different places, the bootleggers were able to sink their own mines in a way that uh, people in West Virginia wouldn't be able to do. Interesting. So, so the properties of bituminous coal the way that 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 is i saw one yeah i, I saw one person sort of did, uh say bituminous is sort of the veins are like this anthracite the veins are like this so uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so does the 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 way that the bituminous veins are in the in the ground um make coal bootlegging 
uh, easier or, or uh, you know, is it, is it well, more conducive to, to the practice of, of uh, you know, non um, major, you know, uh, major mine operation mining? Yeah, yeah. Um, horizontal veins are, yeah, conducive to major mining. You know, now they have uh, long wall mi miners. They have all sorts of like heavy machinery that does most of the mining for them. Um, and they enter into one big space, whereas the anthracite being at steep grades and uh, also kind of in like more remote places, you know, um, that made it that made it possible for bootleggers to do what they did because they started by doing it at night, you know, up in the mountains where nobody could see them. And, uh, and the veins can be like three foot or less thick sometimes. I mean, they can also be much larger, but, um, again, not really, there were a lot of small veins that the companies never touched cause it wasn't worth it to them, you know, or too difficult to access. And so that's what the bootleggers had to work with. And so you mentioned, um, that, Nowadays, you know, it's uh, the practice is still pretty much alive, but but they have leases on the land and they're um, it, what, do you, what did you call it? Uh, small mining operations or or uh, independent mining. Yeah. Independent um, mining, which which alive is a strong word for last I talked to some of the miners. There's only about three of them left open. Three of the deep mines. Um, two winters ago, they took me down one of them, which was really great. But uh, yeah, there was only two miners down and one one up top running the machinery, you know. Uh, so it's very, very small, very family orientated. And they all know that these are the last years, you know, just with the, the, the price of coal. It's also hard to keep employees because the price of coal fluctuates so much, you know. Um, so, you know. If the price of coal goes down, people go get a job at a warehouse or something, you know, and the warehouse tends to pay a little better, um, tends to be a little more stable. And, uh, you know, year after year, this people stop coming back to the mines. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I did see in your book, you did cite one example of somebody who, who was arrested for actual bootlegging, right? Uh, can you talk about that? that oh, you mean recently? Yeah, that I think it was uh, 2000, 2006. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, the independent miners, they're legal in the sense that uh, they have leases uh, or some kind of arrangement with the property owners to mine the coal that they do. And then they're also, you know, legal by government standards, which is contentious. It's that movie last, the bootleg miners, Hard Coal, the one that uh, you screened a little bit of, which you, get, you can watch on YouTube for free. Um, it gets into the whole issues with their legalities um, in terms of regulations and things like that. Whole whole issue with applying the laws of big mines to small family operations. Um, but yeah, yeah. As as late as a few years ago, there was somebody arrested for they had a, a mine that was legal. They had leases. They sank it down. They ran it. They mined it. And then they just kept on mining across the underground property lines into Reading Anthracite and mined, uh, I don't know, a couple thousand ton uh, coal out of it. Um, they they were, yeah, I believe arrested. I don't know what the legal outcome for it was, but uh, yeah, it still goes on. It still goes on. And I mean, I've also met people who, you know, say, oh yeah, you know, I, I still have a spot out there that just up in the winter, I'll go get a little bit of coal. You know, I don't tell anybody where it is. So, yeah. And, 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 the the official mines are closed, most of them, right? I, and and so that's how they're able to like kind of do that, the underground sort of uh, slant drilling kind of thing, um, and, and slip under the radar, right? Because they've they've all pretty much closed, most of them. Oh yeah, there's no more underground mines. Um, there's only a dozen maybe two dozen uh strip mines left and the strip mines they're not like mountaintop removal in uh, west virginia and things like that they're much smaller scale and so yeah there's just really not a whole lot of it going on interesting um so um let's talk uh sort of more broadly about the practice of coal bootlegging um you know, you, your book focuses on the 20s and 30s as sort of a big, uh, you know, boom for bootlegging during that period. Um, 
let's start with um, what's a trucker, what's a breaker, um, and, and just give me a little a little background on what is uh, the process of, of, of bootlegging. Yeah, so um, it would start like even before this time period that I'm covering, it would start during strikes, you know, to hold, hold out longer. Uh, miners would go sink uh, really small mines, almost just open pits, you know, by hand. And, uh, you know, use that coal to, um, you know, maybe pay the grocery bill or just to keep their house warm, keep their family's house warm, you know. Uh, and then when the mine shut down for a longer term, they sank those and they became more elaborate and deep deeper, you know, started mining more coal out. And it very first, it was used the same way again, you know, pay off the grocer with, you know, a ton of coal or whatever. Um, but then, yeah, as it, as it expanded and it became clear that the mines weren't kind of open again and just more kept closing and more people kept coming out into the hills to bootleg coal, um, then it expanded. And it expanded first with the truckers, right? Uh, trucks were trucks weren't new at the time but it was new that people could just aff could afford them right uh and so some people who had worked around the mines they uh saved up and got a truck and started taking it to whatever place they could eventually they were taking it all the way from maryland up to connecticut you know uh and as the the amount of coal the bootleggers were putting out kept expanding um through the early 30s then they also began to well this was contentious but uh, needed needed breakers, people who would take the raw coal from the mine and break it down in size and then maybe sometimes like wash it too, sometimes clean it out. And then so they'd be like the middlemen to the truckers um, and they could get a little more money for a higher grade coal. So all this coal, unlike, uh, again, unlike the bituminous stuff, unlike the West Virginia type coal, Kentucky type coal, um, this stuff is being used for home heating at the time. It's not power in factories, right? Uh, and so that's who they're selling it to is just regular everyday people. And so, again, with the breakers, they needed those so that uh, the person at the end of the line, they're not, you know, getting a bunch of coal full of rock or full of dust or, you know, things like that, just a little higher quality. But at the end of the day, they were just always selling it for a dollar two less a ton than the companies were. And this is Great Depression. There were plenty of buyers. So. And that sort of created a... a uh bit of a contentious alliance between the bootleggers and the um the shopkeepers right because the shopkeepers had uh a lot of them had an interest in keeping the railroads running to their shops right so um i don't know yeah maybe you could talk a little bit about that and a little bit um about how how the practice of bootlegging um, made it clear to the bosses that without the workers, there would be no coal um, and, and really as a flex of worker power there. Yeah. Um, well, let's see which order to take that in. Um, as far as like what it meant to the bosses, you know, uh, uh, the bootlegging was being done uh underground i don't know a better word for it you know of course it was underground but it was being done secretly or at least like literally and figuratively yeah yes. <laughs> there we go there we go um yeah so uh but then as it expanded actually actually they had um they ended up having good bit of support from like the merchants and stuff like that because it ended up being when there was nothing left open and it ended up being those boot like cold dollars that kept the the places open um and oh sorry i just lost that train of thought <laughs> sorry we yeah we, uh, actually i asked you too many questions at once <laughs> so for the so we got going on the shopkeeper uh thing but um oh, mm -hmm. i you were you oh. were going to answer um what did the what did it mean to the bosses yeah so it was a constant demand of the bootleggers that we will stop doing this the second you open up and hire us again you know uh, and they also felt that by selling bootleg coal all over the place, they were proving there was a market for more coal out there. Um, and so it was a constant general demand, especially once they formed unions, once they began speaking like publicly to the newspapers and things like that as bootleggers, they would always say, uh, you know, you companies, you guys can make this go away overnight if you want to. Um, there was one really cool case though, where, uh, you know, the bootleggers, when they did get organized, they 
did it outside of any other existing body. You know, they weren't the UMW, they weren't the mine workers union, they weren't anything else either, you know? Um, but there was at least one case where, uh, where the mine workers union at one particular place that had closed, they entered into negotiations with the coal company and said, um, publicly, they said, we, you, we're giving you like two weeks and if you don't reopen by then, we're just going to all go to that place and we're just going to bootleg the whole the whole thing, you know. And uh, that did it kept their negotiations open for a while. And it was very bold for like the a UMW person to say that officially. Now, granted, they weren't high up the chain or anything. You know, this was a local representative. And uh, I'm sure everybody higher up the chain than them just turned a blind eye to this. <laughs> um, so it's not to have to come in. Uh, but it was a uh, pretty yeah, very bold and creative uh tactic ultimately didn't work for them um it you know kind of it did keep negotiations going for a while but also the truth is they were probably already bootlegging that land anyway you know but yeah interesting so that actually leads me into my next question about so you trace the history of the the miners movement i mean you go all the way back the book the date range technically starts at 1925 but you go back to the 19th century and talk about the molly mcguires and uh and everything and uh i found that that part of the the book really interesting um but then later on um into the start of the depression and and everything um the organized mine workers movement um, found themselves at odds with the rank and file over equalization, this idea of equalization. So um, can you explain what is equalization um, and why would the, would, would the United Mine Workers and the other official uh, unions oppose it? Yeah, this whole thing deserves a book on its own that has you know yet to be written. I tried to research more of it, but I could really only end up telling it in the context of bootleg coal. But bootlegging was this whole movement going on at the same time in the same place that this whole equalization movement started up. And so equalization argument was, okay, instead of closing uh, two of the four mines, you should just reduce everybody to 50% time, everybody 20 hours a week or whatever, you know, that way everybody has employment. Um, and what's What's remarkable about this is that it was like very seriously supported by em employed miners and unemployed miners, you know, uh, even though it would have meant that everybody was, you know, in poverty. Uh, they felt that they still would have had a job and some income and they were willing to share that. And it it played out differently in different areas throughout the region. Up in like the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, it led to within the UMW, basically a civil war. There were like assassinations, bombings, um, all sorts of really wild stuff going on up there. Um, and then in the in the area that became the heaviest bootlegging area, there were actually just too many mines closed for equalization to even be possible. Right. Who's trying to work three hours a week, you know? Um, yeah. But then, but then the uh, the picture he showed, uh, you showed, um, is from the Panther Valley, where uh, it got huge support. They um, they officially weren't the union; they were the Panther Valley Equalization Committee. They would hold UMW meetings for you know five minutes and say, "Okay, motion to dismiss. Okay, great. Now opening the meeting of the Panther Valley Equalization Committee." <laughs> you know, uh, to say they were a separate thing, and uh, they. They successfully, for years, uh, forced this one, forced the one company that owned all the mines in their towns to to equalize working time, and they did it by if they did it by running in the newspaper uh, who how many hours everybody had worked at the different places, and if one place started to get too far ahead of everybody else, that place went on strike and just refused to work until everybody else had caught up to them, um, which the UMW. I mean, a whole other book here could be the UMW's perspective on all this, right? But the UMW uh, at first resisted it. They really had no plan whatsoever for what to do about massive unemployment, you know? Um, but there was an ideology at the time, um, like a very AFL style ideology from that time, that that's just none of uh, labor's business. You know, how places are run, things like that. Um, they should really just stick to representing the people who are still working. And so they had nothing to offer the unemployed 
Um, hence all these other movements cropping up. Um, but then after having so much conflict from it and with the, the new deal coming around and, you know, John L. Lewis kind of in the ascendancy politically, um, then they, they never, well, no, they actually did fully embrace it by like 36. They would include it in contracts, but not really take it seriously. But the, the main thing they did do though, was just turn a blind eye to places where people were doing it. Um, and just de decline to comment, you know, decline to comment, just be like, don't bring it up at conventions, things like that. So, yeah, so, it <laughs> sounds familiar <laughs> in a way, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, some of our some of our leaders today. Um, but uh, I, actually, uh, before we get so you mentioned the John Lewis years and, and into the the uh, NRA and everything. So um, we'll get into that for in a second. But um, before we do, I want to zoom backwards in time a little bit. Um, and uh, because I mentioned before, you talk about the Molly Maguires in your book. Um, and uh, also you talk about the Civil War draft and uh, how there was a, a, a tension um, there in the Irish uh, immigrant community about the draft. So um, I, if you could quickly uh, give, you know, a, sort of a short little uh, thing on the Molly Maguires and then, um, and then talk about the, uh, the draft riots. Yeah. Uh, first off, uh, I got these printed up recently. I'll have to send you one. Um, you know, in a lot of places, that might Love be it. something only a, a labor historian would get. But in the anthracite region, people know exactly what that means. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the history of the Molly Maguires uh, and the Civil War is pretty fascinating. For anybody who doesn't know, the Molly Maguires were basically uh, among Irish mine workers in the 1870s. Um, after they tried to form unions and were just crushed, uh, they took to, well, there, nobody can really agree on the facts because there's not a whole lot of proof, but uh, mine owners were assassinated. Uh, things were burnt. Things were blown up um, as a way to win miners' demands when unionization wouldn't work. Um, there ended up being uh, all these show trials. There were like lots of people... Um, Lots of people killed uh, or executed, I should say, basically as martyrs. This right here is an example of what of their coffin notices, which is what this is kind of paying homage to, which is, you know, you didn't they didn't have to kill the mine owner right away. First, they'd leave a threatening note like, hey, change this or else we're going to put you in this thing right here, you know, in the ground. Um, but the there's a cooler history that uh, is somewhat more recently been explored. Um, there's even a book called The Molly Maguires and the Civil War Draft or something like that. But uh, but yeah, so the, the Irish like uh, are fleeing the potato famine. They get to the U.S. Um, a lot of them are recruited straight to the anthracite region where they become miners. Um, and then, there, then all of a sudden there's a civil war and the uh, mine owners are very supportive of the union on the whole, right? And basically just out of reaction to that and reaction to the idea of there being a draft at all, the, um, or drafting them, people who have been in this country for just a couple of years and are basically, you know, <laughs> basically a lot of them are in somewhat indentured servitude or debt peonage to the companies already. Um, they, they start resisting. There's also like a conspiracy theory that, uh, that the mine owners are going to bring, want to free the slaves so that the slaves can come take their jobs. But in any case, uh, they, they form, uh, in some cases they form militias. In some cases it's more like acts done in the middle of the night. And this is where they think the Mollies really had their origin. What, um, and in like pretty much the, the boldest move, uh, the, the U.S. ended up sending some of its army into Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, in order to, like, uh, suppress the draft resistance there. And at one point, they're, like, ambushed by a militia alongside the road, you know? And so this kind of, uh, this very militant history runs all the way back to the beginning of coal being mined out here. Yeah, it's interesting, the contrast between the Irish immigrants and the German immigrants that were coming at the time, because the Germans were some of the quickest to join the Republican Party and join the Union cause because of the Know Nothing Party. They opposed mm -hmm. the Know Nothing anti-immigrant party 
And so they decided it was it was uh, important for them to get involved in in politics. So contrast that to to many of the Irish workers who who didn't want to be involved, I guess, and, and didn't. See yeah, it I mean, that. it's it, it's like you have to go deep into this stuff to start to understand it, because the perspectives and like the circumstances are like so radically different from now that it's hard to just uh it's hard to just one off like, oh, this is why they did that. There was so much different, th so many different things going on. So, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of times people try to apply modern day standards to the past. And that's uh, unfortunately an ahistorical understanding. And so you don't get a real, you know, rich understanding of the subject. So, um, yeah, but that yeah. is, so it, it's, it, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so for instance, um, the conspiracy that the mine owners wanted to free blacks to replace the Irish, like, while that is a conspiracy theory and racist, like, it's also like, that is what the mine owners did uh, to the Welsh by bringing the Irish over, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, I, we, we see echoes of that today, with, you know, with uh, anti-China stuff, you know, workers mm -hmm. uh, and unions saying that, you know, China is the enemy because they're sending all our jobs to China and, and all that kind of stuff. And we know it's, you know, those of us who are internationalists, you know, know that, that the working class struggle is international um, and it's not, uh, you know, between nations so um yeah no yeah, who, so who are the they that's moving all this stuff around that's the that's the issue not not right. who ends up doing the work at the end of the day yeah exactly yeah for sure um so one of the parts of your book that was re really interesting to me was where you talked about the communist party during the depression and you talked about the communist party's um unemployment councils uh, and how they, uh, and then how the people that they sent to the anthracite region adapted their unemployment council idea to the particularities of the region. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I have a whole chapter of the book, plus it goes into it from other pieces too about this, but the communist unemployed councils, uh, there were, there were also um, the Socialist Party and some other um, socialist type groups also had uh, similar organizations that eventually all merged. But uh, the Communist Unemployed Councils were the biggest. They would have they would they were trying to set up unions of unemployed um, who could pressure the state for uh, like welfare rights. Um, they wouldn't have used that term then. They didn't have it yet. Um, but also like uh, militantly resist evictions, utility shutoffs, things like that, and always doing it by uh, by the pressure of the people, not by um, oh here we'll like so and so knows them they'll handle it. No, it was like everybody shows up to the office at once, everybody shows up to a house at once, and uh, these things exploded across America. There weren't a lot of people who necessarily were in it the whole time. Right. It was a lot more of like when people needed it, they came to it and then maybe fell back later, you know, but as long as there's a critical mass of people to take action. And also it was I don't know what term you want to use for it. I'm sure there's specific terms, but uh, they weren't actively recruiting all these people into the Communist Party. It was actually uh, like a mass struggle. And they just and they felt like, OK, you know, if we see people putting in real leadership here, we'll try to bring them in. But it wasn't just, hey, we're the communists, come come get involved, you know. But it was also wasn't secret, on the other hand. They weren't trying to hide that they were involved in it. Um, and so, yeah, the I mean, and the Communist Party this time is, like, fascinating. It was at its peak in America, I would say. Um, and there, there was a lot of hard lines coming down. You know, you must do this, you must do that. This is the correct way to interpret this situation, right? And the Steve Nelson, the Steve and Margaret Nelson, the organizers who came from the Communist Party and were sent to the anthracite, which which, by the way, was seen as like a dud assignment, you know, among the like click in New York City where you really wanted to be if you're really, you know, really going to work your way up in the party. Um, the anthracite was seen as like purgatory, you know, but whatever N Nelson's they took the assignment, they came out. And they found, you know, about 50 people who were mostly stuck in the 1920s Communist Party, which was very much about like 
our number one priority needs to be like destroy the socialist party, <laughs> like destroy the unions, make our own and things like this, which really didn't go over well in the anthracite region. Um, and so the Nelsons came with a much more pragmatic approach. They wouldn't, they wouldn't make a big deal out of it, but they, they co collaborated with other leftists in the area. Um, they were strategic about what issues they push. You know, for instance, if the party at large said, okay, we need to have uh, front and center our message be like the U.S. needs to recognize Russia, you know, in, in this way or the USSR in this way, uh, they'd be like, eh, we're going we're gonna to back off that one a little bit and stick to the issues that people are here fighting for, you know? Um, and, you know, I put a good deal of Nelson's uh, quotes because he was also, I should say, a lot of the, a lot of the boot, not a lot, a lot of the communists were also bootleggers, right? Not because they were like infiltrating or something. They were just one in the same. They were just rank and file miners who were members of the communist party who lost their jobs, who became bootleggers along with everyone else. And they were some of the earliest people to push for the bootleggers to form unions. And they eventually held office in some of the bootlegger unions, but it was never like a communist controlled thing. Um, nor was it a communist project, right? The, the party, like the Nelsons, um, outlook was like, we're, we're as the party, we're working on the unemployed councils. We'll support the bootleggers, no doubt, but they didn't feel like it was a, a great means to an end towards revolution or anything like that. Um, and I think, I don't remember the exact quote, but there's something good too, which is like, well, the bootleggers already figured out how to get what they need. You know, it's not about a demand and fighting power. It's actually like about just going and digging that coal. You know, they don't really quite need our help. Um, but anyway, uh, the book though, I recommend it American radical by Steve Nelson. There's two chapters about the anthracite and the bootleggers and the unemployed councils in there, but also he fights in the Spanish civil war. He ends up on some high ranking, uh, uh, communist, um, committees, we'll say something like that in the U S uh, fascinating guy, great stories. Hmm. So yeah, but that, I mean, there's a lot more to say and there's like a lot of really cool applications going on in the book so yeah that's that's really interesting one of the things that um i noticed in the book um my my area is sort of in the intersection of religion and socialism mm. uh in the antebellum era um and i noticed there were some clashes between the irish catholic ideology and the communist ideology um, although not as much as you might think, it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as contentious as people might, might think. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, there's, um, there's this great quote or great set of quotes that didn't make the book that I want to write something up with, uh, where one of like the more conservative people to be involved in the, like involved in leadership in the bootleggers union, he was pretty anti-communist, which a lot of people were like, meh communism, whatever, you know, I got other things to worry about. Um, whereas this guy was more out and out communist, but he really, he says like, you know, I got to admit they had some great ideas at times, but then they would get to talking about how Jesus wasn't, you know, real. And like, <laughs> you know, all this. And that's where I had to say, ah, I don't know about that, you know, but then he goes on to tell a story about a time he saved one of the communist lives, you know, and another time when one of the communists saved his life. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, those, those are some really cool stories, but it also encapsulates like, a, yeah, a bigger thing where the communists realized like atheism was not going to play super well. Not only are there like the Irish Catholics, but a lot of the Eastern Europeans um, are, are uh, Orthodox, you know, and it's a very, very religious area, very religious people, not definitely not all of them. But uh, then again, maybe not so much among the Minersville Lithuanians, because there was I don't remember if this quote made the book, but they said to be a to be a good uh, Lithuanian, you have to be a good communist and vice versa, you know, at hmm. the time. Interesting. So, yeah. 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 At For, least in that yeah, town, this is a picture, you know? picture of Steve Nelson here. I just. Uh, <laughs> up there. Yeah. Interesting. What an amazing fellow. Photo. Yeah. <laughs> And this yeah, he's one of those a, historical yeah. characters who just like happens to pop up in like all these major situations, almost like Forrest Gump style, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, this yeah. is from my Abraham Lincoln Brigade website. So he was uh, very much involved with the uh, the Spanish Civil War organizing too later on. So, yeah, mm -hmm. very interesting. 
Um, it's other than Steve, uh, Steve Nelson. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, are there any particular, I always love, you know, also as somebody, you know, who, who deals in local history and is fascinated by the historic, the history of the region where I live. Um, you know, I always think like, when you find out something new about the history of your region, it's like this beautiful aha moment. And it sort of makes everything, the street names and everything, mm -hmm. you know, really come alive in a way that you, you didn't realize before you had this knowledge, you know, but um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, were there any moments like that for you in researching this book? And uh, also were there any, you know, I always I always try to stay away from great man theory, uh, but um, you know, it is it it's interesting narratively to focus on a particular individual. So there were there any individuals that you found especially fascinating, either heroes or or villains? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to approach this as like more traditional narrative history where I took one or two people's story and followed them through the events, you know, but by the time I started researching this, everybody who had been involved had passed away and I was able to find this oral history collection of uh, interviews with about 40 different miners. But the thing is, none of them was in all the places at all the times, you know? And so I, I ended up piecing together, it still is a narrative history, it's just told by all of them, rather than through one or two people's uh, personal stories. And, you know, this is, a, this is a question I've gotten a few times already, and I think I'll get a lot more of like, but what's like one person's story? And there, I'll tell you about the one person who I really wish I had their story, right, was this guy named Earl Humphreys, who uh, was a cop first, like a local cop, and then... Or maybe he worked for the welfare department, the, the version they had of it then, the poorhouse. In any case, um, he uh, he loses his leg in a mining accident in a at a company, you know. But then when everybody loses their job, he gets in on bootlegging too. So he's running his own bootleg mine with his you know one leg and presumably a few buddies. Um, and then when they start to form the bootleg unions, he becomes the the like the first like president of the overall like umbrella bootleg union and then refuses payment, keeps bootlegging for money, even though he's got this one leg. And then uh, after a couple of years, he stops taking that elected position, but just becomes their like general representative, you know, whenever the news wants to talk. And he takes like a very, like very like level headed approach to, to things that like the miners just all in all respect. And, reading about how the bootleg meetings happened, you know, you'd have three, 400 people, 300, three, 400, uh, not just miners, but illegal miners, right. Arguing out different points. And somehow this guy won, not just their respect, but like all the bootlegger union respect. I really wish I knew more about him. And then, um, world, when world war two comes and bootlegging gets cut off again, he goes back to being a cop, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because in in the 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 coal uh what they the coal there were coal police, right? They were that that kind of worked for the coal companies. What was that? What was the relationship there? Yeah, yeah. So uh he in particular was not one of those, he was a local cop, but um so this this also like happens right in the middle of like some major like major major history of police reform right uh, the state police is a relatively new force and they are uh, they were the first state police in the U S and they're basically a political force that does what the governor tells them they and the bootlegger union make truce with three different governors saying state police are going to stay out of it for now right. Uh, the coal and iron police are the industrial police who have been around a lot longer. And I believe we're also the first like industrial police in America. I could be wrong on that one though. I shouldn't say that. So, um, it's always tough with, it's always tough when you say first. It's, right, 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 right. I always question um, when, when people say the first. Yeah. Something. The state police one's pretty clear. The coal and iron, not as clear to me, but in, in any case, they were sanctioned. They were private employees of the coal companies, but with the power of law, to arrest and do anything else a cop would do. Um, but they, 
after some large strikes and stuff like that, and then some other events in Western PA, they became so hated that they eventually were stripped of their right. Like they could continue being company guards, you know, but they were stripped of their right to act on behalf of the state. And that happens like dead in the middle of this bootlegging stuff, you know? Um, and so it's also interesting because in some towns there was not a mine left open. And some of the only coal company employees left are the guards, you know? And their whole family's bootlegging, their whole neighborhood's bootlegging. You know, that's their world. And most of them, the bootleggers got along with because most of them said, I'm not going to touch this. You know, I'm not going to get in anybody's way. But there were a few who took their job very seriously. And um, there's a lot of great stories about the confrontations there. You know, one in particular, um, this guy, uh, Reese, can't remember his last name, but uh, he's a he's a coal and iron cop. He rides his, his uh, motorcycle out to the coal holes. You got to get out of there. Da, 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 da. Uh, while he's talking to him, somebody else grabs his motorcycle and throws it down a mine shaft, you know. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of stories of the coal and irons just being chased right back out, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I you brought this up in your book, and and I think it's an important point that I brought up in my uh, the review that I wrote as well, is that you talked about uh, these communities as being uh, democratic, communitarian um and, and militant and rebellious um and, and sort of those three i i sort of see those three properties as being something that's sort of eternally present in the working class and uh i wonder if you what lessons do you think um we can take today for uh you know both you know as scholars and uh as as activists and and communists those of us who are communists um what what lessons can we take from the bootlegging movement yeah um in general i i left that question open in the book because i think there's a lot going on that people can draw you know i think i think anarchists and communists for example are both going to be able to pull on things and be like wow that's really that's really it you know but i think the the main lesson that i take away is just the uh the organicness of the organizing that's happening you know like I said, there's various movements going on. There's still the union. There's all this, you know, but there's no uh, there's no like tendency driving any of the, like one single tendency driving any of these specific things. And so when you have like everybody reverting to bootleg mining like this, um, that means you have everybody in the community there, you know, involved, like with all their differing opinions, with all their shit they don't like about each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? All that. And I think I think the lesson is when like push comes to shove and it's like when push comes to shove, we can do it, you know, uh, and people know how to do it too. They didn't, um, they didn't reinvent like how to have meetings or anything like that. Um, they uh, pretty much just kept doing it the way the union did it or kept doing it the way the American Legion did it, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think, I think there's a lesson in that in like, how do we, how do we meet people where they're at? Because these people, they didn't get met where they were at. They were just were the only ones where they were at, and they were able to do it with the tools that they had, you know. And uh, you know, I think I think they had a much stronger sense of community in general than we do today, especially in America, which is mm. you know something I think about endlessly. But I, I do still think when push comes to shove, you know, like we're we're the only help that we have at the end of the day. Um, and when you can build a system where you have to rely on everybody else for, for that kind of help. Um, it, it strengthens people. And when it's successful in this case, it radicalized people like these people were, were radical, but they wouldn't have said it, you know? Uh, and it was, it, was, it snuck up on a lot of them. <laughs> and in interviews years later, it's kind of funny in the two main counties, you know, in interviews, you interviews years later, they'd say, Oh, them guys over in Northumberland County, they were the radicals, you know, and then you go over to the Schuylkill County. Oh, them guys over in that county, they, they were the radicals, you know, um, and uh, nobody's there still saying, oh, yeah, we were sure we might have uh, dynamited some company equipment, uh, you know, marched on the Capitol a few times, uh, fought, fought off the police, you know, uh, but but we weren't radical. You know? <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, yeah, it's just something about a spirit that's there. Now, I some of it's like very specific to coal mining, and like I talked about in the beginning too, very specific to the geography of this. And I wish I could tell you, oh, here's an industry that we could just go take over ourselves, you know, uh, in this way. And that I really can't speak to. But um, but the the thing is, there's nothing there's nothing genetic about this. You know, the spirit that these people have is a spirit that any people can have in the right circumstances, and that's at the end of the day, the most inspiring part to me. So, Yeah, that uh, makes me think about um, my my final question for you here uh, is, uh, so this is another clip from that uh, Hard Coal documentary um, about the the modernization of the industry and, and what it looks like today. I know, you know, the... Um, the Green New Deal and, and, and environmentalists and things today want to do away with coal burning altogether, which, um, you know, we need to do away with fossil fuels altogether, really. Um, but one of the most striking uh, examples of just the utter environmental destruction um, that certain forms of mining um, can do is is what you see there, uh, mountaintop removal. And um, there's a guy, uh, yeah, this guy, uh, he talks about, uh, Julian Martin, he talks about how we could probably mine coal underground for the next 150 years and, and still have enough of a supply uh, the way we're burning it. But that's, that mountaintop removal is much cheaper he said it used to be you know there were, were there were a couple hundred guys working in a mine underground mine today with mountaintop removal you'll see eight or nine guys out there working so i don't know what do you think about that shift in the industry and what do you think about uh the move um you know away from burning fossil fuels altogether yeah i mean first off i mean we gotta we gotta stop burning it uh like just point blank, you know, because it's, it's looking, it's not looking good for that. Um, which I find very hard to, to cope with. Like, how do we, how do we stop while we can still inhabit this planet, you know, especially first world countries where, uh, we reap so much benefit from doing it, you know, uh, it just, there's been moments where it seems like we might have something. In, and I, right now I feel like we're at a moment where, it, the outlook is grim. Um, but regardless, uh, you know, I, I respect the miners um, for, for what they do. I respect the underground miners, you know, I, because they're taking this risk and doing these things. But uh, I think the stuff is better left in the ground. Um, and also all, all mining is like, has a huge environmental impact locally. Uh, there's not like, a clean way to do it. You know, um, a lot of streams and creeks I grew up around are orange, nothing lives in them, you know? Some of them have been remediated lately, which is great, but also uh, very expensive uh, and requires continued maintenance. Uh, but also um, minerals are used in a lot of other things, including anthracite is used for like water, like your Brita filters, you know, might come from anthracite, uh, a lot of graphite is made from, you know, different things like that. Like there's gonna be mining. Um, and so the mechanization has been like a continuous thing since day one, uh, in, in mining anthracite. And, uh, it was a big issue in their day strip mining. It's like, there was like some tiny strip mining with like literal steam shovels before then, but, um, they're like an anti-strip mining movement is also part of what's going on in this book's time period, you know? Uh, and they, towards, towards the end of this time period, they end up like confronting and dynamiting, like maybe about a dozen different, like very large power shovels. Um, but yeah, this, the stuff that happens today, the mountaintop removal, well, actually, I, I don't know if any companies are left in business who do that, which don't quote me on that, but is that is at least nice. Um, but then again, if you go out to like, look at the stuff happening in Wyoming and things with those machines, you know, it is just on a massive scale. And part of it though, part of it's that it's visual. And so we can understand the impact, you know, whereas underground, you can't see as much impact, but regardless, the labor question is dead on. Um, 
like the, the couple uh, independent miners still out there, you know, like I said, might have three people work on a mine, might put out 20, 20 tons on a good day, you know, out of their mine. Uh, you have mines operated by less than 10 people elsewhere in the country that might put out 100,000 tons a day, you know, just with the level of mechanization that's going on, um, which is insane. There's a lot to say about it, including that uh, black lung is like way up. You know, for years and years, it was declining. And in the past uh, 15, 20 years, it's shooting way up again because when the, the regulation is lax, but two, like the more they mechanize it, the more fine coal dust in the air, you know, like how do you literally and physically rip that much coal out of a mountain in one day? You know, <laughs> like only, only with, among other things, only with filling the air with so much dust that people who are working in there are like their health is actually going to be worse off than somebody underground mining, which is, I mean, I shouldn't say underground. They are underground. I should say uh, more primitive mining like the bootleggers were doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I know they're, they're, you know, there's also a labor question with the, the bootleg mining, because I know that in, you know, in the past, children have been part of it whole families used to be part of it in the period that you describe in your book um and and there were accidents in these mines right mm -hmm. and and there they i mean versus a, a major mine you know it it seems like they might be more dangerous but i don't know i think the the um you mentioned you you respect the the independent miners who uh, who still do it today. I don't, you know, I certainly don't think they're responsible for the kind of environmental uh, destruction that the major mine companies are for sure. Um, but, but what about safety? Is, is safety uh, still more an issue with these independent mines? Uh, again, there's so few of them today. So that documentary, again, is a great place to look. I think there were, at the time of that documentary, I think there were like 12 or 15 independent mines left open. And they, they make a pretty clear argument, which is like, this is my brother, my nephew, and my son working here with me. You know, like, uh, all the regulations in the world aren't going to like trump that in terms of me wanting them to come back out of this mine at the end of the day. Um, but accidents, accidents still have happened, I think. I know, I know there was at least one mine accident that killed someone in the past. Actually, I think it was right before that movie was made. I think it was like 2008 was the last mm -hmm. accident I know of. Granted, I do know this other guy dedicated the book to him, among other people, David A. Lucas, who claims to be the, well, he passed away recently, but he claimed to be the world record holder in mine safety, <laughs> something like 28 years with no accidents, no you know? Um, but, uh, but back in the day, ton tons of accidents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, very frequently, um, rescues were a big thing. Um, I, I cover it in the book, but honestly, I didn't do it justice as far as it pops up in the newspapers because it's just continuous. Uh, the thing back then that is, there, there's a lot to it, but, uh, but in the bootleg mine, you were more likely to be in a traditional mining accident underground. At a company mine, you are more likely to be one part of a disaster that kills you know, double digits or two mangled in surface machinery, which is where like, I think maybe the majority of fatalities were coming from at the company mines at that point, you know? Uh, um, so yeah, uh, as far as child labor, I mean, that's the same issue you might want to take up with farmers, you know, like mm -hmm. what, what is our labor system? You know what, who should be working and what's the point? What's the purpose? Like, how does this all work? And for the bootleggers, especially before they were independents, um, this was like removed from the workplace. This wasn't a workplace. Like this was a different sphere, right? Uh, at the yeah. company mine, you clocked in, you clocked out. Only the employee was there, you know? Um, when it came to bootleg mining, uh, getting that coal out every day and cooking dinner, they're part of the same thing. They're part of like what your family is up to in that day to survive, you know? And so the lines were a, a lot more blurred. Um, there were more, <laughs> well, I say more women in the mine. There weren't any before. Um, so there were more women in the mines, more kids in the mines. And, uh, and likewise, there's at least a little bit of evidence that there were more men in the kitchen, but I don't want to exaggerate it either. <laughs> you know, there was at mm. least some degree of that. So. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, you mentioned um, 
some of the uh, you mentioned in your book, like the um, gender in the industry and how uh, how gen gender relations in bootlegging contact contrasted with gender uh, relations in the official uh, collieries. Is it collieries? Is that how you pronounce it? Collieries, uh, collieries, whichever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what what was the breakdown there? How how were gender roles different in in independent bootleg mines versus the official collieries? Yeah. This is this is the flip side of what I was saying with accidents, where there was so much coverage, and I only put a little in the book. I really put all the things I could find about gender into this book, and it wasn't a lot. Um, there were uh, so I didn't mention, but bootleg mines were basically cooperatives, but they called them partnerships. You know, they'd be partnerships between families. So, uh, you know, you might have three partners, but um, the rest of their families are working in there. And so there were there were women working in the mines. I can't say how many, you know, and they played different roles more often on the surface. But some of them were underground miners. I found photos of three different women from the time. Um, and there were a few women who are like partners in their own right. Uh, in some cases, it was because they were widows who just like any other person, you know, they're just like, what am I doing for money? I don't have an option. This is what I'm doing, you know, digging this coal hole. Um, and, but I don't think they were all widows. You know, I think there might, there was like one woman who I think might've been a single woman, but again, now we're talking, there's 14,000 uh, people doing mining, trucking and breaking in the bootleg industry. And now we're talking about like, Oh, there was this one woman who did this, this one woman did that. So it wasn't, yeah. It wasn't that crazy widespread, but, um, but there's, you know, so much to it. But uh, another thing was like before the breakers or some mines didn't like the breakers, uh, they might crack it at home. So the coal got mined on site, then taken home. And then the whole family sat out and cracked the coal in the yard. Photos of that too. So mm. uh, yeah, but, but the, but the general thing I was saying is like a break away from like a, uh, traditional strict workplace that we think of now is this was more of a family endeavor that is yeah comparable to farming where okay maybe you're not doing the bulk of the labor but you do your part you know type of thing yeah family business <laughs> yeah it, very interesting well uh i think we're uh we're coming towards the end here of our discussion um do you have, have any closing thoughts or anything? Or obviously, uh, we want to plug the book, uh, Bootleg Coal Rebellion. Um, bootleg, what is the website? Bootleg Coal. Bootleg Coal. Com. Com. It's also, it's on PM Press. So that site's just going to link you to PM Press to pick up the book. So you can pick it up wherever you pick up books, you know. Um, I, uh, I, you know, encourage people to ask their local library to get a copy. Um I, yeah, I thank you very much for having me, uh, other Mitchell, fellow Mitchell, you're the first one to have done a review of the book. So, uh, I love that. Um, yeah, thanks for, Excellent. thanks for talking. Thanks for digging in with me. Yeah, it was great to talk to you, uh, about this important and, uh, understudied piece of history. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was very enlightening for me, uh, reading the book. So I, I definitely, uh, enjoyed it. And I saw today that uh, PM Press tweeted a quote from my <laughs> from my review of your book, uh, pushing it. So, cool. uh, when is is it out now, or when does it come? It out? is out. the The official release date uh, is like in a couple of weeks, but um, everybody who pre ordered them just got them. I have uh, some cases of them sitting in the other room, so it's available. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mitch, uh, for uh, speaking with us today. And thank you for uh, sharing your book with me. I, it, it was uh, very fascinating and I, I learned a lot from it. And I think, uh, you know, we uh, we communists can can definitely take lessons from it, um, from the way that the Communist Party organized um, during the Depression um, and the way that that, you know, um, especially Steve Nelson and, and certain particular uh, members of the Communist Party tailored the way they organized to um, the communities that they were in. So very, very interesting. Th thanks very much, Mitch. I hope we, uh, we talk again. We'll bring you on to promote your next book. <laughs> cool thank you <laughs>
All right. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody uh, at uh, Midwestern Marks. Um, thanks, everybody that's been on this stream. I will see you all in the future. Um, this is MKJ signing out.